Hi, Pastor Karen here, and welcome to another episode of From Surviving to Thriving. As I was reflecting on where we are right now, the pandemic, COVID-19, the cases, deaths, infection rate is on the rise. It's spiking throughout the United States and in Arizona. Uh, we have just made our way through a tumultuous um, divisive election. We're still trying to unravel the repercussions of all that's currently happening in our country and state. Uh, we are getting ready to go into the holidays and we're just getting out of Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving we've never had before, getting ready to go into a Christmas that we've never had before. And I really thought it best for us to revisit an episode that I aired earlier this year. In June, I did an episode with the Reverend Tandy Miles. She is a child care professional, and she gave us lots of tips to help us manage at the time as we were preparing to go into the summer. In this pandemic, in racism, now we're getting ready to go into the holidays and winter break, Christmas break for lots of our young people. And we're still dealing with racism and we're still dealing with the pandemic. Kids have gone back to school and now are back virtual. There's a lot of stress on both sides for our children and for the parents. So it's good to hear again, some of those tips and tools she gave us to make life a little bit better for them and to make life better for us. So I wanna reshare that video with you today, that discussion. I hope you enjoy this conversation we have today with the Reverend Tandy Miles. Hi everyone, this is Pastor Karen uh, with another episode of From Surviving to Thriving, Life After Crises. I am very excited to have as my guest today, the Reverend Tandy Miles. Um, I wanted to have Tandy come on um, because I know many of you have children or grandchildren and uh, we have had them out of school. You have had them out of school for a very, <laughs> very long time. And now we're deep into the depths of summer. And I thought Tandy could give us some great hints and tips on how to manage the summer. But since my invitation to her, lots of things have happened in the world that um, are not only distressing to us as adults, they are also distressing to children. So let me tell you a little bit about Tandy. Uh, let me tell you, when I got her resume, I, I keep telling her, I just want to read the whole thing because um, she's very well credentialed and uh, you'd be surprised who you have in your circle of influence. But she has her Bachelor of Science degree from Arizona State University in Family Studies and Human Development. She has her master's uh, in social work. She also got that from ASU. Uh, and after uh, completing her higher education, she started her career in social work, working with foster parents, foster children, and well, as well as the DCS system. She has 15 years working in the field as a social worker. And her work history has provided her with a broad experience base in counseling people of all ages. She says that she is honored to work in the field and that she loves what she does. She is also ex has extensive training in infant and toddler mental health. She has a certificate in infant family clinical practice and has received a level three endorsement from the infant toddler Infant Toddler Mental Health Coalition of Arizona. She is also registered as a play therapist supervisor. She says that play is the unique language of children, and so it has been great to see children manage life's stressors through the play experience. She is also working on a Master's of Divinity in Family Counseling, and she is the mother of a toddler herself. So let's welcome Tandy Miles with us for this fantastic conversation about not only ourselves as parents and grandparents, but also this wonderful conversation about our children. Tandy, glad to see you. Glad to see you as well, too. <laughs> <laughs> 
I have to ask, just right off of the bat, in light of us coming through COVID, still in COVID, coming through protests, how are you and Jonathan doing? Well, um, COVID was very hard because um, Jonathan was out of school for a while. And he's been in school since um, he was a baby. So four months of age, he's always had that same regular routine of school, um, coming home. And so when he was at home, he was just like, what is going on? Um, and so we did have like a lot of like anger, um, just not knowing like what's going on. Why can't I go to school? Is it my fault that am I keeping him away from school? And um, just really having a lot of conversation about what was going on in the world and why we couldn't go to school. Um, and so now that things have kind of settled down a little bit, he's been able to go back into um, another school that's open here since I'm considered an essential worker. Um, and so he's doing much better because he loves the socialization. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that socialization with other kids and having that same routine again has helped him a lot. I am curious. You said he is back in school. I didn't know there was a single school open in the state of Arizona. So in Sierra Vista, there is a school that's open. How are they managing that? And how are you feeling about that? Um, so a lot of the child care centers are still open. So there are some child care centers in Phoenix that are still open as well, too. Um, they just have put in precautions in place. So some have like decreased their ratio where may only have a couple of kids in the classroom. The teachers are wearing masks. The children are not, but the teachers are wearing masks. Um, and just a lot of hand washing and um, routines as well as like wiping down things a little bit more. Um, you know, I'm okay with it because it was either my mom or go to school. And I feel like at least if he's at school, he's gonna get that social interaction that he needs. He's gonna be working on things that he needs in order to go to kindergarten. Um, and it looks to me when I toured the school that they were they were doing everything that they could to make sure that the kids are doing well. Um, well, that was, that was going to be my next question. How did they assure you as a parent, and especially a parent with your credentials, I mean, <laughs> you probably went through with a fine tooth comb. How, how did they assure you that your children were going to be, the children were going to be safe? Um, so one of the, the, one of the things is that I work at a healthcare clinic down here in Sierra Vista. And so I really believe in a couple other than healthcare providers, we believe that Sierra Vista saw, um, the COVID in November, December, January. Um, at that time, there was a lot of kids that were sick with high fevers. Parents were giving them Motrin and Tylenol and the fevers were still staying high. Um, and then some kids were coming back with like both flu A and flu B. Um, and so we really think that Sarah Vista got hit hard with something like the COVID um, around that time. And so um, that kind of like reassured me a little bit that, you know, it's okay. Um, he didn't get sick during that time at all. Um, and just seeing the precautions that they were doing as I was doing the tour, asking questions, um, it's very hard for me to pick a child care center with my credentials, yes. Um, and so I check in with them every day to see how they're doing, um, see if there's any um, kids that they've had to remove, if they decrease the ratio even more. Um, they usually, too, they check temperatures. So everybody's temperature gets checked when they go in. Um, and so that's another good precaution as well, too. So what would you tell a parent um, who has had their child out of child care this entire time. Mm -hmm. um, what should they really be looking for in their child care center uh, to ensure the safety of their child as they endeavor to think about their child going back to a child care center? Yeah, anything, um, I would definitely ask a lot of questions about, you know, what are the precautions that they have made in order to make children mm -hmm. safe there? Like anything that they've changed since COVID started, do they decrease the ratio in the classroom? I know one center in Phoenix, Bright Horizons, they have decreased to like six or seven kids in the classroom instead of the 15. Um, so things like that. Um, are they um, checking temperatures when people come in? Are they having a no sick policy um, for their employees? So their employees also know that if they're sick, they don't need to come in. Um, 
are they cleaning how what what's their cleaning um regimen that they do in the, in the classroom are they cleaning all day do they wait to the end of the day um how what what solutions are they using to clean are they using bleach are they what are what are they doing um and so too also just making sure that um your child is enjoying it there they will let you know they will let you know by their behavior when you pick up um, and when you're getting ready to drop off, if they're enjoying that experience or not. So that's how, did you, how did you prepare Jonathan to see a teacher in a mask all day? Did, that, did he have any aversion to a teacher in a face mask or all of the teachers in a face mask for that? Uh, so because I've kind of talked to him about what's going on um, with COVID, um, I let him know that like, there's a big sickness in the world right now. That's why we can't go to the school. That's why we can't go to the park. That's why you're not going to the store. Um, and then he knows too that if we go out, we have to put our mask on. So he has a mask on, I have a mask. Um, and so he's already in that conversation, he already knew about mask. And so when it was time to take him to the school, I just said, you know, remember that big sickness that's going on around your teachers are making sure that you're staying safe and your friends are staying safe by making by wearing this mask. So you'll see them in the mask all day, but you don't have to wear your mask. Um, and so with that, he became comfortable with it because we've had already had that conversation and he had already knew that that was coming. So how would a parent help a child who might be anxious? And is it too early? What is the earliest you might talk to someone about COVID? You know, some people really think that children... Um, and Jonathan is, how old He's is five. Jonathan? Five. You know, some people might say two, three, you know, maybe not that early, but is there a better age to start having that conversation or is there no indicator? Um, I would say about two. I mean, we know that children as young as two, they do understand the language that we are, you know, the things that we're saying to them, either following commands that we're giving them, and they do understand. Um, you just make sure that the, the conversation with, that you're having with them is age appropriate. So you're not going to tell a two-year-old um, people are dying from COVID. You know, you might say that there's a sickness that's going on. We need to make sure we stay safe. We're going to stay at home. We're going to wash our hands. Um, grandma and grandpa might not come over, but we're going to talk to them on the phone or we're going to talk to them on FaceTime just to make sure that everybody stays safe. Um, and then as they're older, you can um, give them a little bit more information. And you, as a parent, we all know our child the best. So you want to be mindful not to give your child too much information that will make them anxious. Mm -hmm. but if you have an anxious child that you know needs a lot of information, then you still give that age appropriate information. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Since we're talking about children and potentially their anxiety because mm -hmm. of COVID, um, in light of all of these protests, in light of um, racism and, uh, and the great upheaval that we have seen in the country over the past few weeks, um, how do we help children grasp what is going on? Um, uh, the, the thing is, is that they already sense something going on, especially if parents are watching the news or on their Facebook or having conversation about what's going on. They're already sensing that. And so I think just being honest with our kids and letting them ask questions, um, giving them the information about what's going on, that is going to help them. Again, kids understand what we tell them. It's when we don't tell them things that that creates anxiety and then they create their own story of explain what's going on, which could actually be completely wrong, right? And so with us giving that information to them, it kind of basically allows them to kind of process the real reason as to what's going on. So we don't want our children to create their own narrative. <laughs> yes, yes. We don't want them. <laughs> Yes. We won't have a lot of people creating their own narrative. We won't right. to do that as well. Right. So is there, you know, because I, there was a, uh, I saw on uh, social media that there was a social media influencer who actually caught some flack for taking her child 
to a protest. Mm -hmm. Is there some apprehension that we should have about taking or involving our children in the dynamics of protests and what could potentially happen in a protest? Yeah, I mean, that, again, that's ultimately up to the parent, but be mindful that, you know, um, what age are you considering? You know, would I take a two-year-old to a protest? I might not, depending on my two-year-old. You know, if my two-year-old's really scary or really apprehensive, I might not take them. Um, I know some people take teenagers because they want them to be able to experience, you know, this change in movement that we hope that we're about to see. Um, But also letting them know, like, hey, this is what happens, and if this or this happens, we're going to go this way or what have you. So preparing them for the protest, Um, you know, when we were driving this weekend, Jonathan saw the protest and he said, mom, what's going on? Why are they, what are they saying? Why are they saying it? And so I had to come up with something really quick of what happened. Um, And so in doing that, that helped him to understand what the protest was. Now, will I take him? No, because he's, he's pretty, a, a pretty little anxious kid. And so we'll be talking about this for like, days and nights and stuff like that. So I, w- I wouldn't take him, but um, it just really depends on the parent and how the parent knows that child and the safety. So, you know, some of the protests have been very peaceful. Some of them have been not so peaceful. And so that, that fear that parents may have that my child may get injured and in going to a protest, I mean, it, it's a true fear, right? Because we're, we're really seeing that. Um, and so it really... I mean, I would just kind of look at who my child is and what the protests are looking like in my city as to whether or not I would take a child there. So there really isn't a one size fits all when it comes to our children and their mental health and their levels of anxiety, uh, even for children in the same family. One Mm -hmm. child certainly might not be like the next one and you might be able to take one child to a protest, but you got to leave the other child with somebody because they can't manage it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, I have an example of, um, I believe when I was in Phoenix and there was a big protest about, um, um, I think a Hispanic child was, uh, was uh, he was killed by the cops. Um, and this family was the actual family member of um, this child that, was, that died. Um, and they took one of the, the nine-year-old girl, who's the cousin of the child that died, um, to the protest. And they couldn't understand like why she was having all these like anxieties around sleep and um, having difficulty with toilet training again and um, just really like not wanting to leave her mom, not wanting to leave her dad. They couldn't understand why. And so as I was digging and digging, I finally found out, oh, well, they, she, took, she went to a protest um, and, she heard, and she hears all day long about how her cousin died. And so that was creating a lot of anxiety for her. Um, and then they had another child that they took and there was nothing going on. So again, like you said, it just depends on each child. Yeah. So we just need to pay attention to the signs that they are exhibiting. So if a child who has been potty trained, who seems to be um, just fine and, and, and things are going normal, what are some indicators that they are having some level of stress and anxiety that we need to pay attention to? Um, some children will be very clingy, um, meaning that they just want to stay next to you. They don't want you to leave. Um, or if you guys go out, they're just really hanging on tight to you. Um, difficulties with sleep. Um, some kids may have difficulties falling asleep. Some kids may have nightmares, um, night terrors, or have some sleepwalking as well too. So sleepwalking can be a sign of anxiety and stress too. Um, also, um, like complaints about stomach aches, complaints about headaches, um, complaints about um, just not feeling good. Um, those can be signs of anxiety or stress. Um, sometimes too, like your, your older kids, they may say that they feel like their heart is beating really fast. They feel like they're about to have a heart attack. So signs of anxiety or panic attack can also look like um, a heart attack. Um, even in children. We know that with children. Even yeah. in children. Even in children. Most of your younger kids um, are going to say that their stomach hurts, that their head's hurting. Um, 
And, and that's usually an indicator that something's kind of going on. They also may regress with having some bedwetting um, or just not being able to control their, their, their bowels or um, their urine um, throughout the day or, or at night. Um, so that could be another thing. What should a parent do if they notice some sort of um, behavior change in a toddler or even in an older adolescent? What is most parents, uh, and I reflect on my parenthood, and God knows being a grandmother has made, if I could have started this life <laughs> as a grandmother, I would have been a better parent. <laughs> I say that and apologize to my own child. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, uh, and because parents will, when they see a clingy child, it's like, come on, what's going on with you? And we don't kind of back it up. So how should a parent what should they do if they just kind of see this and this conversation we're having having now kind of mm -hmm. shakes them and it's like, oh God, maybe my kid is really having some anxiety that I hadn't anticipated or I just thought they just wanted their way. What should a parent do? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you, I tell parents all the time, you know your child, you know your child very well, you know your child better than a therapist will, better than the doctor does. And so you kind of know when something is not right with your child. And so depending on how old they are, sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's just asking the question, like, how are you, how are you doing with being at home all the time and not being able to go to school? And how are you feeling about this whole COVID pandemic? Are you, I'm wondering if you're, you're scared or if you're worried. Um, how are you doing with, you know, hearing about the protests and hearing about Black Lives Matter? Um, does that make you scared for anything? Yeah. Um, really having those conversations with those kids that can really process and talk about what's going on is going to be helpful. And then also um, just really um, meeting that child's need. So whatever I always say to parents, like challenging behaviors are letting you know something. And there's a meaning behind that behavior. And so if you can figure out what the meaning is, then just meet the need even if the need is attention, right? So like a lot of people are like, my child just wants attention, my child just wants attention. Well, if you know that your child wants attention, then meet the need and then they won't do those behaviors that they need to do in order to get that need met. Um, so just little things like that. Um, also, you know, a routine. So one of the things that we saw go out the door with COVID-19 is that the, the whole routine yeah. kind of went the door too. Yeah. Um, and so routine provides kids with consistency and predictability. And that actually calms our body in order to know like, okay, there's this going on in the world, but my routine is still the same. Um, and so I really, really tell parents to really stick to those routines, especially getting up in the morning and that bedtime routine. Um, and so if you can stick to that, that's going to help your child with um, managing any kind of stress or anxiety that's going on from all the life changes that we've had. So you, you, one of the things you just mentioned was, um, what if my child is clingy and <laughs> they need attention and then give them the attention that they need. But some parent is hearing you say that and they're saying mm -hmm. they want attention all the time. Mm -hmm. all the time and I give them attention and they still want more attention and so they so the parent is flustered yeah what can a parent do for a child especially if they have other children mm -hmm. who wants all of the attention all of the time is that an indicator of something else how mm -hmm. does a parent manage that it could be an indicator or something else. Um, of course, I would have to know a little bit more information. <laughs> is it not free? Somebody out there is going a free counseling session. <laughs> you need to talk to your counselor specifically so they have the information. Here's the disclaimer: the information specifically on your case. All right. Yes. Um, but that can be an indication of, so of of something that's going on for that child. Um, also, too, like you know, it's. It's, I always know too if I'm not giving Jonathan enough attention. Um, and he's an only child, so he gets attention all the time. But for some reason, something can be going on for him and he just needs a little bit more attention. And I always, I, and you know, just like you said, like I know all this information, but my parenting is not great. Like sometimes it goes out the door. 
Um, but I, but if I remember and I stop and I give him that attention that he needs, he's more likely to go do something that he wants to do and not really need me so much because I've met that need. And so it could be something as simple as, you know what, um, I see that you're, you're needing some attention from me. Why don't you come help me make dinner? Or why don't you come help me fold the laundry? Um, they can still be near you and you're still giving that attention and you're also giving attention to the other kids. Um, and I know that there are families where there are some kids that just need so much attention and you've got like three other kids that you need to take care of and do all these other different stuff, but just try to include them a little bit more um, because that's something that they're needing. And we don't want them to get that in another way at another time. Right, right. I appreciated the, way, the, the example you gave because you said invite them to come help you fold clothes. So you can, you know, if it's really inviting your children into the, your space and some of the stuff that you have to do, mm -hmm. let them help you do it. They are mm -hmm. getting your attention and mm -hmm. you are still accomplishing some of the things you need to get through done throughout the day. I think sometimes parents think, well, my kids can't do that. You'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially. Especially no, when they want that time with you, you know, they, I mean, to them, it's like, oh, we're doing something together. Yeah. 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 Um, help, let so, them help you cook dinner. Let them help you fold the clothes. Let them help you clean up. Um, mm -hmm. Make their own little vacuum. So as you vacuum, they can vacuum with you. you yep, can Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give them their own little sponge. They can clean too. Right. Right. How do you help a child um, create routine, especially if you as an adult, might not be a routine kind of person. It, you know, for me, I think in lists. So routine is my friend. I don't have any challenges. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter and I always laugh because Joshua, I think out of my routine with him, uh -huh. comes in, puts his mm -hmm. shoes in his room. He knows exactly what grandma expects mm -hmm. and he has taught Janelle and Jayla's gonna learn too. <laughs> All of them are gonna learn. I love it. <laughs> so, and, and, and different houses have routines. So I know Jessica right. has her own house routine, but there might be some people out there who say, I don't even keep routine. I don't have a routine. How do you teach or show a child how to have routine? It's all through modeling. So basically the adult has to start somewhere. Um, and I usually just tell people to like, just, you know, what is it that you would like to be a little bit different in your everyday getting up, going to work? Um, you know, most of the time people are like, oh, I hate being late. I just hate being late. Okay, so if you don't like being late, then let's, let's set up some kind of routine where you get up or you do things the night before. And so it's really just figuring that out for each parent and each family and just doing it. Um, it's not going to work right the first day. It's not going to work right the second day. We know like what, it takes 21 days and create a habit. So it takes too long, but it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. So it's with practice. Um, it's, it's, it's just with practice. And as you do it more and more, kids will pick up on it and they will do it too. Okay. And kids ultimately want to please their parents. They really do. There's things that happen in that, that kind of go array, but at the end of the day, they really want to please their parents. And so including them, um, in that stuff of creating routines too. Like, hey, you know, we usually get up and we usually do X, Y, and Z. How about we start doing that like that every day? Um, it really, we make it harder than what it really is and it can be really simple. Yeah, yeah, it could really be simple. And, it, and, don't, and don't bite off, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So start right. with something simple. We're going to get a get up and have breakfast routine. And let's right. just do that right. And then we'll right. move to where do your shoes go when you come home? <laughs> and do it incrementally. And at yes. that routine, you might as well learn routine. Yes, yes. I mean, one of the things that Jonathan has picked up really easily is that I will talk about what we're going to do for the day. So he already, he already does that. Um, so he'll say, mom, so how about on a home day, we get up, eat breakfast, we play outside with my Jeep, and then we come in, we eat lunch, we take a nap, and then we get up and we go to grandma's house. And then like, so he'll do the whole routine for the day just because we've started with talking about what we're going to do for the day. So it, 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 it's really simple. Once you start it and you be consistent with it, it, it will, it will go.
and and if you aren't consistent, it will bite you. It will bite you. Yes, consistency. Worst, the parent's worst enemy. Right, right. My grandson is very accustomed. I tell, and it, I think it's a it's a jail term. So forgive me, Joshua, but he's used to three squares. And <laughs> And, and, and the senior pastor and I, we eat a square. And so he's like, so is this breakfast? Is this lunch? Is this <laughs> so I got to make sure my baby gets three squares. Three squares. <laughs> so that's his routine. I get breakfast, I get lunch, I get dinner, I get a snack, I go to bed. Yes. So yes. They Don't forget the snacks. They'll hold you to it. Don't yes. forget the snack. Yes. Um, I want to back up a little bit because um, we talked about the stressors of COVID. We've talked about the stressors of um, just all of the upheaval that we've had in the state uh, and in the country. Um, but I want to, especially as the mother of an African-American boy, um, I've never had to have the police talk. Mm -hmm. Never, never had to have that talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I have an African-American, you know, daughter, but mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to really reflect. And I, I don't think I've ever, I've, I think I've talked about safety, but not that real specific mm -hmm. with a police pull you over. This is where you put your hands, da, 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 mm -hmm. all of that. Um, how do you manage that conversation with your child without making it seem like life for them is going to be futile or if they do have a run in with a police officer that they are ultimately going to die. I know, and I know kids today have seen death way more than most of us yes, have yeah. in our adolescence. And so they have a, a Teflon to it that I didn't have, you know, how, what, what, as a parent, how do we manage all of that with our children? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think the biggest thing is really making sure that as parents, we have our own support. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a real fear and it's not even a fear now because it's, it can happen. It's a, it's, it is such a reality. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think everybody who's watching is going to be like, you know, there is no, there are no words for the yeah. feeling you have as a parent. That yeah. Am I going to see my child tonight? Yeah, yeah. Over nothing. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Um. So I mean, when I got when I when I was pregnant with Jonathan, um, I think that was the start of some of the the, the police killings. Um, it, it was, I was pregnant in 2014, so I can't remember who, who was the focus at that time. But I remember that um, that was a big fear of mine when I found out I was having a son. Yeah. And I was like, what am I going to do to make sure he stays alive? Right. And to make sure that I know how to raise him the right way so that he stays alive. Right. Um, and at that time, I had went to a conference, and there was this lady there. She's a social worker, and her name is Marva Lewis, and she does a lot of research around the parent-child relationship in African-American communities. Um, and she said to me, I remember, I, I, we were, she does a lot of research around African-American hair um, and how that doing hair influences the parent-child relationship. And wow. So Oh, that is interesting. That is very interesting. It's very interesting. Marva Lewis has a hair story. <clears throat> Marva Lewis is her name. It's very interesting on how that. But I remember going up to her and I said, you know, I'm so glad I'm not having a girl because I don't want to have to worry about the hair. I'm just so glad I can take it. Right. Right. And she said to me, and I'll never forget, she's like, yeah, but we gotta you got to figure out how to keep him alive. God in heaven. And God. I was just like. Oh, God in heaven. Felt it. Yes. Me. Yes. Um, and even now, I mean, even when, when um, we saw the protest the other day and I had to have that conversation, I was like, and I think I posted on my Facebook, like, I'm not ready to have that conversation with him right now. Um, one, it's, it's scary to think about. Two, how do I tell a five-year-old what's, what's age appropriate? Right. Um, 
But the thing is, is and this is what I and, and this is what I had to remember is that kids already are aware of color differences by this age, um, because later that night he said, "Was it a black cop or a white cop?" Hmm. And I said, "It was a white cop." And he said, "And was the guy a black guy?" And I said, "Yeah, the guy was a black guy." Um, and I kind of just waited for him to see if he was going to ask any other questions, and he didn't ask any other questions, so I left it right there. Um, but it's been on my mind, like, how, how am I going to have this conversation with him? When's the right age to have that conversation with him? And then what do I say? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm still working through that. I'll probably be seeing my own therapist for that. Um, <laughs> but I remember, like, I have a brother. So I remember my mom and dad having that conversation with my brother when he got his license and when he got his car. Um, so, I mean, I was there to hear the talk and, um, I remember it and I know that that talk is going to have to happen. Yeah. Um, but for parents, I would just say we really have to, um, be in touch with what's going on for us on the inside when we're thinking about having a conversation with our kids. Yes. Um, if we are feeling a little bit too much emotion over it, which I mean, it's, it's real emotion, um, Sometimes that can go a little bit bad for kids, but then sometimes it can help them to understand, hey, this is a real deal. Like, right, right, right. Um, so so emotion, so we shouldn't back away. We shouldn't back yeah. away from the emotion we see. But if it's a visceral emotion that might make yeah. the conversation a little more graphic than the child needs, we might need yes. to reel it back a little bit. Right, right, right. Um, and I think at this time in our history, it's really the truth. I mean, the truth is going to save our kids' lives. I mean, there is no sugarcoating. Um, it'd definitely be age appropriate. Like I said, like you're not going to tell a two or five year old, but you know, as they're getting up in age, I mean, I, I think the conversation has to be had um, and they need to know the truth um, so that they can be able to survive in this world as well. You know, we're not around them all the time when things happen at school or if things happen um, at, you know, some sports or extracurricular activities. I mean, we're not right in there. And so if they hear something or somebody says something, um, we need to help them to be able to have the appropriate response. We need to help them to be able to understand why that's happening so that they don't be clueless, that they're educated about what's going on. So there... You said your son at five, Jonathan at five, is very aware of race. Mm -hmm. So we should not be naive in thinking that our yeah. children don't understand race and racial dynamics until right. they are older. Right. It, it, I, I remember the first time I was called the N-word. It was in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And I kind of didn't know what to do with it. But it, you know, just as we know, racism is right. systemic racism and right. racism, it can start early. Very early. In the crib from slavery and these mammies who were raising these little white children. Right, right. So we get, it, we, it gets, it gets bred into us very, very early. Very, so very early, yes. We, should, we shouldn't shy away from the discussion, but like you said, it is, needs to be age appropriate and we should not think that they are naive to mm -hmm. what they see mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, even before all this happened, um, I, down here in service, I've seen so many kids who have been um, discriminated against by other kids, um, jumped by other uh, ethnicities, um, called other kind of names. Um, and I'm, I've been really shocked that kids as young as, fourth and fifth and sixth grade are, are doing this, um, but we can't be naive. It's, it's happening. And so we have to prepare our kids because like I said, we're not, we're not there all the time um, and they need to know. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I want to talk to you about some broader topics beyond COVID, okay. beyond um, uh, all this racial stuff that is going on in the world. Um, how do you broach subjects like sex and sexual abuse with children. How as a parent um, do I keep my eyes aware? Every time I turn on the news and I see that this teacher 
has abused some child. Um, I First, I'm shocked because I'm like, what do you see in a child sexually? Right. Yeah. And so, but I recognize that that's a whole nother show for a whole nother day. Another and, <laughs> and, and, it, and it shapes how I pray um, because there by the grace of God, you know, many of us go. So right. some of these behaviors, we don't know what has precipitated them, what has happened in these people's childhoods. We just do right. not. Know. So we need to have a sensitivity while still requiring justice. Right. Um, but how do you, pick up on it in your child if something inappropriate might have happened and how do you help them to keep an eye out for inappropriate behavior without stripping them of their childhood? Yeah, I mean, I, I really talk to parents about really um, having the conversation about how this is their body and it's not okay for anyone to touch their body um, it, with, you know, the hard part about this too is that there have been some parents who have done some child yeah. abuse as well too. But um, I usually just say, you know, mommy and daddy and the doctor are the ones who can, you know, look at your body and make sure everything's okay and make sure you're safe. Um, if anybody else touches your body and you don't like it and you don't want it, then you need to let mommy and daddy know. Um, I also talk about using the correct terms for, right. um, for your body parts. Um, just because when sexual abuse cases come up, things can get a little weird when you're using different names. Um, and then it becomes hard to really tell if something really did happen. Um, so definitely letting your kids know, hey, I have a penis, you have a vagina. It's okay for them to say that. Um, most parents get worried that they're going to be saying vagina, vagina, vagina out in the supermarket. Um, if they do, you just correct it and say that's something that we talk about at home um, and we don't say this in the store. Um. <laughs> the parents who have a problem with the stigmas because I think a little kid who understands and knows what a vagina yes. is, where the vagina is, that's a smart kid. Yes, yes, yes. I had a parent ask me that the other day, like, do I, can I really say it's a penis? I'm like, yes, say it's a penis. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> they need to know, especially when you, I mean, because if they, if they're calling it something else by some pet name mm -hmm. or play name, mm -hmm. if abuse is going on and they're telling a teacher mm -hmm. or someone, an adult, that they may think they're talking about a toy. Right. Using this pet name. Oh, my daddy plays with my, you know, whatever you call it all the time. Right. And, right. And, and, and when they get older, they're like, my teacher never did anything. Well, I thought you were talking about the stuffed animal on the right. bed. I didn't right. know you were talking about a body part. So it's, right. I, it's, good. it's very important. Right. So, I mean, one of the examples was um, I work with this little girl and she had called her vagina a cake or a cookie. Um, and so we were like, we're, like, are you talking about a real cookie or a real cake? Or are you talking about, what are you talking about? Um, and then a DCS worker always told me about how there was the story of um, this little boy. He said, you know, my daddy put his PP in my PP. Um, but what he was talking about was the dad peed in the toilet and then the little boy peed in the toilet after him. And so that's what he meant by PP in my PP. So <laughs> that's why it's important. The first when you said it, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> right. We're talking about real urine. Right. So that's why it's really important to use the correct terms. Um, and then too, I mean, there's, there's sexual behavior that is normal for each age. Um, some parents are a little appalled by some of the the behaviors that are normal. Um, but some of the behaviors are normal. It's, it's some behaviors are not normal. So um, that's a whole nother probably. Whole nother episode. I don't but, know if you're prepared because I was sitting here going, do I ask this question? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to venture out on a limb. So, uh, as, as some of these guys say, okay, if you're super Christian, you might want to turn it off right about here. Because I'm going to ask the question. It's not even all that bad. But I think we have an expectation 
that right. boys are going to masturbate. Right. And we do not have any expectation about that behavior in With girls. girls. And they and do. It's normal in girls. Yes. As yes. Um, and girls actually start younger than boys. So, so prep yourself, mommy. <laughs> She's in there doing that too. And I get questions about it all the time. Um, and they're just like, oh my gosh. I'm like, it's, it's, it's normal. They're exploring their bodies. They're figuring stuff out. When they start to um, put objects in their body, that's when we start to get a little bit concerned. Okay. Or if um, they're trying to, um, most kids to play, I want to see your stuff and you see my stuff. That's, that's normal too. But when it gets to be a little bit overboard or they're doing that all the time or um, uh, things just kind of get a little bit weird, um, that's when we know that like maybe we need to check on it and see if something's happening. Is there a particular age when, so um, I know many parents um, shower, bathe, and a change in front of their children. Mm -hmm. It's just normal. It's no big deal. Right. You don't see it odd. Um, is there an age when a parent should start saying, well, maybe we shouldn't start doing that now? I know in European countries, naked body, it no, it's just really no big deal. I think it's the American perception of mm -hmm. sexuality that has everybody in, you know, the big brouhaha, you know, right. Because we're so nervous <laughs> about sex and bodies and all the other kind of stuff. But is there, so is there a time when you should say, okay, well, maybe my kids shouldn't sleep together or maybe they shouldn't see me shower or change or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, that really is up to the parents. Um, and again, up to the child. Um, I usually say like about four or five, that probably should stop mm -hmm. uh, because then you want to teach them about privacy. Okay. Um, and the privacy part is, what also goes into the conversation when teaching them about how no one's supposed to touch your body is because those are your private areas and we have to have privacy and we need to have, and you're teaching them how to have boundaries around their body. So yeah. I, there's a lot of conversations about like, don't make your kids give hugs and kisses to extended family members if they don't want to, because that allows them to, um, express that this is my body and I allow whoever I want to allow to kiss me or hug me. Right. Um, when we allow kids to kiss and hug everybody, then it doesn't, it doesn't show that, that this is a privacy and, and this is a boundary around my body. Right. Um, right. So that's, I mean, that would, that would be what I would say. Yeah. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I, t you know, I have told parents cause they'll say, Oh, say hi to pastor Karen. And they just kind of look at me and I say, you're teaching them not to speak to strangers and I'm a stranger. So I am right. not offended that they, d they don't know me yet. Right. They're right. Just, oh, they're going to discover pastor Karen has toys in her room and right. <laughs> office, you want to go to Karen's office because she has lots of stuff for you to play with, but until they're comfortable. And right. I think sometimes we forget about the messages that we tell um, our kids, you know, don't right. speak to friends, but, you know, go up and say hi and go up and do this and go up and they're like, mm. Mm -hmm. it's a mixed message, right? So, you know, one day you're telling me I, I'm not supposed to talk to people I don't know, a stranger. And then the next day you want me to go and hug, you know, Pastor Karen. Right. Or Pastor right. Karen. I don't know. She's still a stranger. She's, She's still she a stranger. Might she might smell good, but I don't know that woman. Right, right, right. <laughs> so it's a mixed message, which also, yeah. you know, that's how those mixed messages happen when an abuser comes. It's like, well, you know, I, I, I'm supposed to have boundaries around my body, but I did hug Pastor Stick, Pastor Karen, and, you know, that was okay. So maybe this will be okay. So those mixed messages is kind of, it kind of puts our kids in a vulnerable situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about... Um especially in light of COVID, but what about death and dying? How do you help children and adolescents, even teenagers mm -hmm. manage, uh, especially, you know, like, like, like I said earlier, they're kind of Teflon now. They, violence is so yeah. in everything. So it's in video games, it's on TV, it's in the movies, it's, mm -hmm. you know, everywhere is violence, everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we help our children manage grief and loss? Yeah, I mean, um, I just had this conversation with a parent today, actually, um, 
you know, it's, it's really important that we don't hide the grief and loss um, that we're feeling and having. It's just really important that, you know, at the end of the day, we're always models to our kids on how to do and how to be in this world. Mm -hmm. and they're going to follow us on based off of what we show them. And so if, if there's someone that's died in the family or, you know, in a friend, um, sh you know, you're going to be sad. You're going to cry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be, it's okay to cry. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to show all those emotions in front of your children because they're feeling the same thing too. Yeah. Um, and, and that's when you can have a conversation with them about, you know, sometimes I am so angry that so-and-so died. Why did they leave me without telling me bye or, you know, what have you? And so, you know, you'll find that your kids are feeling the same exact way. Um, and then it, it just can be a process for, you know, the whole family. Um, sometimes kids take it a little bit harder depending on the relationship with that person that's passed. Um, and so um, really kind of working through with them um, on how to process that grief. It can be drawing, it could be writing, it could be music, whatever that kid is kind of into um, making rituals around, you know, that death, talking about um, families' beliefs. You know, for us, we believe that, you know, if, if that person was a believer, they're, they're in heaven. And so really talking about that as well, too, um, with, with kids. Well, now you say something that is telling. Mm -hmm. And that is, you said, oh, if they're a believer, we know they're going to heaven. So how do you, do you, maneuver it if there's some doubt or is it a parent's place to kind of say really everybody's going to heaven with children who kind of don't understand the concepts of heaven and hell and truth is that every christian we don't know um, right right <laughs> right we really don't know we don't know we really don't know <laughs> it's safer to kind of put everybody in heaven even if we if it was that nasty uncle who was mean and cussed out everybody, never went to church and told everybody right. that right. Uh, you can't never get me in nobody's <laughs> church. Um, so do you still put them in heaven for, for younger people? That's a good question. It just it really depends on the age too and what they understand and what they don't understand. Um, it might be easier to just put everybody in heaven until they can understand a little bit better. better. Right, right. Especially said, just, honey, you'll be surprised when we get there. Right, right. I plan on going. Do you plan on going? It's a spiritual <laughs> opportunity to start talking about Jesus. <laughs> right, right. I mean, we talk about my dad a lot. And so Jonathan will ask questions all the time. I mean, he asked this morning, you know, why do we have to get old? Why do we have to go to heaven? Why is it, in, why is heaven so long from now? Like, he'll ask all these questions, and I have to make up as I go. Um, and, and, the, and those are conversations because some people may not realize that your father is deceased. So right. these are conversations your, your son is having about his grandfather. Right, right, right. Because he says that sometimes grandfather comes down and plays with him. And so... Um, and you I, don't freak out. And I don't freak out. I mean, I used to, but I don't freak out anymore. And so... Um, is that natural? Is that natural for children or no? You know, I don't know. Um, I have heard that a lot in my work with children, that they will say that. And I don't know if that's natural. I don't know if that's because there's a lot of conversation around about that deceased person or pictures. Um, not sure. Um, but I, I have heard it a lot. Um, so it wasn't too surprising to me when he said it. Um, but he does. He, he'll ask questions about getting old. He'll ask questions about um, uh, why do people die? Why do people, um, why do, why do people go to heaven? Um, what is heaven like? What do you do? Do they have TV there? Like, he'll ask all those questions. Of course, <laughs> TV in heaven. Wouldn't be heaven without TV. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon right. Prime. What are we going to do in heaven? Right, right. <laughs> All the questions he asks, I feel like I don't know anything. <laughs> Even as a professional. Right. So that is encouraging to every yes. parent and grandparent because you have credentials and your son stumps you. So us yes. uncredentialed people can be stumped. Yes. And it's okay. Yes. It's okay. Just it's not okay. To it's, it's just okay. okay not to know. It's okay. <laughs> Since we're talking about spirituality, is there a too young age to talk to children about spirituality? 
I don't think so. Um, we know from the research that most kids are, um, are learning spirituality from their parents. Again, the whole modeling process and what the, you know, it's, it starts at home. Yeah. Um, and so um, it's, there's never too, too young to start that. Okay. I want to now just kind of venture off. We've talked a lot about children, but okay. you also have some experience with adults. Yes. Some of these parents and grandparents are like, look, I've had them jokers since April. And I used to look forward to the summer, but summer started in April. Ooh, April. <laughs> and now, <laughs> June. Right. And I still got July, August, and maybe September, October, November, depending on the school district. Right. What should parents first, how do they manage this for them, this anxiety, this having to have become their child's teacher and discovering sometimes what the teacher said about little Johnny was true because <laughs> we <laughs> believe that our child is not an angel. What they say, some of them discovered, oh, they don't pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, but what should these parents do now that they're at the summer and it's been, they've been in summer for two months since spring break. Yeah, and there's nothing open for you to go take a break. Nothing open. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I really talk to parents about trying to really get a break, even if that means that you go and you get in your car and you drive or you just go sit at the park in your car. Well, in Phoenix, it's pretty hot, so make sure you have an air conditioner. Um, and so those little breaks kind of give parents... Um, I call it the umph, the umph that they need to kind of continue to do the things that they have to do. Um, being a kid's teacher, I don't know how y'all did it, bless your heart. Um, I would have been like, I can't do it because I'm still working full time and I haven't got time to teach him anything. Um, but the thing is what I tell parents is just know that like, this is just busy work really to kind of still be able to do school and don't put too much pressure on yourself. Don't put too much pressure on your child. Um, and try to take breaks in between for both of you guys. I mean, parents are tired of kids and kids are parent tired of parents. And so allowing some, some time apart and breaks that you can do. Um, one parent, you know, take a break here. The next parent, take a break there. You're a single parent like me. I don't know. I just go into my car, into my closet. Um, I get to go to work too. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, trying to be creative and clever and how to get those breaks and those times apart so that you can kind of recoup yeah. um, is definitely what needs to happen. And that goes back to routine. Cause if you have your mm -hmm. child on a routine, um, and you get them down at eight o'clock, just because it's right. summer means, doesn't mean that you're starting to stay up till 10, 11, and 12. Right. Get a break in the evening and go soak in a bathtub or take a shower yes. or just yes. have some wine. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and unwind. Yes, and unwind, yeah. You, I know, I, you don't, you'll take it out on the kids. Right, right. And, and then they're going to take it out on you too because they're tired of you too. So, I mean, that's Oh what my gosh, that... I need you to say that again. They are <laughs> tired of who? They're tired of you too. <laughs> Mercy Jesus, because I don't think any parent has thought about that. We might no. get so tired, but the kids are tired of us. Yes, yes, yeah. they are. Yeah. They really are. They're tired of being at home. They're tired of being at, um, not being able to go places. And, and, and the thing is, is that um, the whole part of childhood is about socialization and being with your friends and doing things and, you know, doing activities, softball, football, soccer. And when all that is done, I mean, that's why we've seen an increase in depression and anxiety in kids. It's because the whole foundation of what childhood is, is gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so your kids are tired of you, just like you're tired of kids. <laughs> We're all tired of one another and everybody needs a break. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but, it, but that's also normal. Yes, so, it's totally normal. It, it's normal even if it wasn't COVID, even if it wasn't any of this other stuff, even if right. they had not been home all spring into the summer. Right. Being right. tired of one another is normal human relations. Yes, yes. Just like you're happy when your husband goes to work and you're at home 
or vice versa. And then they come home and then you're like, oh, I'm happy to see you. I had a break from you. How was your day? What's going on? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. If you could give um, some parents the best advice you could give in light of everything that is going on in our world today, what would it be? Um, I would just say really make time for yourself as a parent because one, a happy parent is going to help a happy kid. Yeah. Um, if you're stressed and you're um, feeling depressed and feeling down and anxious, your kids are going to pick up on that and then they're going to have those same behaviors as well too. So really making sure that you're doing whatever you can do to take care of yourself, you know, making sure that you're eating your three meals and snacks a day, making sure you're drinking lots of water or, and fluids, making sure you're getting your eight hours of sleep um, is going to be helpful in you being a good parent, but also in making sure that you're able to take care of your kids and they are, are, are growing and thriving as a child. Um, and the other thing too is just making sure that you're spending time with each other and having fun. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the cool part about COVID is that we were able to see an increase in families spending more time together. Yeah. And I think um, we need to be mindful to still keep that as, um, as we're getting back to whatever this new normal is going to be, right? And so um, really making time for each other to have fun. You know, it's hot. It's hot in Phoenix. It's hot down here. Going to go to the store and get some balloons and do a water fight or, you know, just doing, coming up with some creative ideas that you can do as a family together. Um, those things kind of buffer the stress that we have that's going on in our world right now. Thank you, Tandy, for this fantastic conversation about how we can help our kids through COVID, how we can help our kids through racial unrest and how we can just be better parents in general. I appreciate you and all the time that you've given us. Thank you for having me, appreciate it. Thank you again for joining us for today's episode of From Surviving to Thriving Life After Crises. It is my prayer that this episode and conversation with Tandy Miles has been a blessing to you we learned some vital things about how to be better parents, grandparents, and a support system to those who have children. Life is tough and it, it doesn't get any easier when you've got little ones who are living this life with you through everything that we're going through. And the mere fact that they have really been out of school since the spring has caused a lot of stress and anxiety on both sides. So I hope you take the tips, the pointers, the advice, the counsel of Tandy and her experience working with children through to adolescents and teens, even for you as a parent, grandparent or support system uh, to get some rest, take a break, get a breather, even if it's in your car or the bathroom so that your mental health is sustained through all of this as well. I wanna pray with you and for you and for every parent who might be watching um, that God continue to be with you and that you be encouraged and strengthened throughout what each day brings. Let's pray. God, I do thank you and praise you always for the opportunity that we have to be in conversation with people who speak right to where we are. First, I thank you for Tandy. I thank you for her and her son, Jonathan. I pray that you would be with her as she has to raise a young black man in America. Give her wisdom, give her guidance. I pray that you also surround her with support as she as a single parent raises that young man in Sierra Vista and for his extended family as well for everyone who pours into his life. God, I pray for everyone who has children at home. I pray for their stamina. I pray for their mental health. I pray for their emotional health. I pray for their spiritual health. God, give them wisdom and words to say as we all maneuver through life 
after and in COVID-19 and after and end racial unrest and systemic racism. Be with every parent, be with every grandparent. Would you season their words as they have to have tough conversations about what is going on every single day. God, I pray for every childcare worker, every teacher. Would you be with them as they are trying to figure out what next semester is going to look like? Give them wisdom. God, give our legislatures wisdom. We have seen some of the guidelines regarding schools reopening and they seem to be a difficult uh, methodology for a teacher, especially a teacher of young children. Give our legislatures and principals and um, everyone on staff at schools wisdom as they try to prepare for the fall semester. God, I thank you. I thank you for every young African-American male in this country. And God, we pray, we continue to pray for protection for every young African-American protection. In fact, for every African-American, for every person of color, protection, God, in these difficult times. We love you, God, and we know you are able to do abundantly beyond anything that we could ever ask or think. So thank you, God, for creating a path through the chaos so that we can raise a generation prepared to manage life in these United States and in the world. We thank you for our future leaders. We thank you for our future doctors. We thank you for our future lawyers. We thank you for our future city employees. We thank you for our future domestic workers. We thank you, God, for our future that is in the homes of families being raised today. We thank you for them, for our future presidents and legislatures. We thank you. And we give you glory and praise for what you are doing in our midst. We love you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I told you it was a good one. And I hope if this was not the first time that you saw it, if this was your second time, I really hope that it blessed you and that it is going to help you get through the holidays. The prayer still stands and I am still praying for you. Please know that for the next two Thursdays, we're going to be off so that we and you can celebrate both Christmas and New Year's with your family and friends. However you choose to do that in light of the crisis, please know that I am going to be praying for you and that I will see you back again with new episodes starting the first Thursday in January of the year 2021. If you want to ensure that you don't miss any of my episodes, please feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel or to the FIBC YouTube channel so that you can always get a notification of when I go live. And on usually Tuesday or Wednesday, there's a notice on Facebook Live that lets you know that we'll be coming live on Thursday. It is my prayer that you have a safe Christmas, a wonderful new year, and that God's blessings be upon you. We're going to get through this. There will be life after COVID-19, and we will get through these holidays. God bless you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year.